Well, from that $50,000, you have to think about, you still have title transfer fees because you have to transfer title to the new buyer. You have real estate agent commission fees. Um, and so we'll throw all of that in there to show you as a seller, what are your expenses? What closing costs do you have to be prepared for as a seller? And we'll have that broken down into what we call um, a net sheet. And it shows your net estimated profit. Then you and your spouse are able to look at that 39 and say, oh, well, we're talking 50-50. This 39 is now divided into two, okay? And that is the first place where we start because that's usually where the anger happens <laughs> um, or that's usually where the excitement happens. Hey everybody, I am your host, Matasha LaQuinn, the queen bee of real estate, and you are tuned in to the throne today. And you're also in for a treat because guess what? You have me all to yourself today. No guests, just me and you talking about a really, really interesting topic. It's a topic that is kind of one you want to walk on eggshells around. However, with the right professional and the right information, just know that it's nothing to be scared of, nothing to be afraid of, but we're going to be talking about divorce and real estate. And, you know, divorce in itself is just, it can get ugly sometimes. You have some of the good ones that are really smooth and just easy, and you have some really difficult ones. And so we're going to talk about what to do when you find yourself stuck in a messy divorce situation and you have real estate to liquidate, because guess what? You now have to figure out how to get through an emotional situation and only rely on business facts. So how do you how do you draw that line between business and emotions? And a lot of times what we run into with our divorce clients, and by the way, the reason why I chose this topic is because within the last few weeks, um, my real estate team has gotten quite a few referrals from divorce attorneys for couples that are um, having to sell property and uh, split the profits 50 50 within the divorce decree and so I thought that this would be a good time to bring or sit, shed some light on the the ins and outs of how this stuff is going right so with divorces you feel like there's a loss you're, you're losing something. Not only are you, you know, losing a relationship, so to speak, or however much time you put in, but you have to go back to the drawing board of when you bought the property and, you know, whether you had to save all of your money together to try to come up with your down payment, whether, you know, the property may have been gifted to you as a wedding gift from your parents. Um, maybe each of you dipped into your 401k and had to contribute money that way. Either way, there's a resource involved that you dumped into this property. Um, you've decorated it together. You've hosted birthday parties and barbecues and slumber parties for the kids. And now you're having to get rid of it. Um, and you feel like I've worked hard for this and I'm having to give up what I worked hard for. And with that being said, I think the, the hardest part about that is when divorcing, you've put all your assets or your resources into acquiring this property. And now when you sell it, you don't get to reap the entire profit by yourself in most cases, right? So you're not able to realize the full equity. You have to split it 50-50. And when you split something 50-50, the profit doesn't look as great as it did as if though you were going to keep the whole pie to yourself. So let's say you were selling a property and you were going to profit $60,000. Well, that 60 turns into 30 for him and 30 for her when going through a divorce. And that 30 is not as attractive. That 30 is not as attractive as uh, a full 60. So we're going to get into um, some ways to navigate through this process and to make it a little bit easier and at least to streamline streamline it and make it as comfortable as possible. Um, I know sometimes you're thinking as well, well, I don't want to sell. 
in some cases, and obviously I'll have an attorney to come on and talk about this, but some cases selling is not an option, you know, especially if neither one of you agree. Now, if you have a situation where uh, one of the parties to, to the, to the situation says, well, I don't want anything. I just want out. I just want to be done. You can keep the house. Then you're in luck. However, if you do have someone that says, no, I put in just as much as you did, we're gonna have to figure this out. Now you have to put on your boxing gloves because it's, it's time to get in the ring. And of course, we'll get in the ring as friendly as possible. But how do you navigate this difficult situation when not dealing with it just isn't an option? You know, a lot of times we want to push things under the rug and we'll deal with it later. But in divorces, especially when you have a decree that's being prepared, um, both sides have an attorney. You're, you can't push it to the side. You have to deal with it. And so number one, the number one key, in my opinion, to uh, getting started on this uh, journey to selling a home in the middle of the divorce is to choose the right real estate agent. The right real estate agent is going to be key. They are going to be the ones that help navigate this process and almost probably mediate <laughs> in some cases. But what you want to make sure of, you know, your 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 agent is going to be more than just offering you technical assistance related to real estate. They're going to be talking more uh they're more than just the sales activity and the sales price and how much profit are you going to gain and how are we going to what days are we going to show the property. This agent has to be a special agent, okay? They have to have patience because Again, they have to know how to navigate a difficult situation where maybe the one of the spouses, they're giving the other one a hard time. They're being difficult on purpose. There's an ego thing going on where they don't want to give in or agree to anything. Um, you present a sales price of what the market says that this home can sell, sell for. And just because they want it to upset the other spouse, they disagree with everything you present as an agent. And you have to be competent. The agent has to be com competent and comfortable enough to take authority and say, hey, you know, I know what you guys are going through. I know it must be difficult. However, we have to remain uh, business minded. We have to keep the ultimate goal in mind here which is to sell this home, get to the finish line so both of you guys can go on with your lives. Um, you have to have an agent that can deal with divorce blaming. Um, you know, the other one is pointing at the other one as to whose fault it is that we're in this situation in the first place. And so uh, you have to, as an agent, be prepared to, to navigate that and to say, all right, this is not what we're going to do. We are going to, we have to work together because I think what gets, what happens a lot of times is that in a divorce situation, each party has, a, has their own attorney and these attorneys represent each one of them as individuals. Well, when you choose a real estate agent and your, your agent in the matter represents both of you collectively. So there is no law. There's no longer. Well, this person says this and this person wants to do that. And, you know, we have to represent you individually. No, you have to be mature enough to come together collectively and have the tough conversations to get along, to decide, you know, um, how are we going to sell this property? What's the best way? Should we sell it as is? Should we make repairs? And you have to be able to have com ha have these comfortable conversations together on conference call, in meetings together, um, because one of the most important things is going to make sure that there are no side conversations going on. Um, and it's better that way regardless. For two reasons, it's better that way, because number one, you're having side conversations. There's always going to be someone that feels left out or what did y'all talk about without me or they blamed me, didn't they? What'd they say? Did they say it's my fault that, uh, you know, the house wasn't clean when somebody came to look at it? What really happened? You know, and so just to play, uh, I guess, mediator and make sure that the parties know that, hey, I'm not here to take sides. I represent you both together. 
there are no side conversations happening. And so, and not only that, the agent doesn't want to have to repeat themselves two and three times, you know, back and forth. And so you want to have the same conversations. And so you're going to have to learn to get along for the sake of this transaction. So now that we know that choosing an agent is one of the most important things you can do. Let's talk about how to go about choosing your broker. Um, in my opinion, choosing your agent, it's not a long drawn out process. It shouldn't be difficult, but choosing an agent to represent you um, in a divorce is as simple as having conversations with multiple agents. And you'll, you can tell by the conversation and just by the vibe and by the chemistry, whether or not this is the real estate agent that you want representing you and your soon to be ex spouse. Um, and in this conversation, you're just, you're, you're, you're looking for, is this person already taking sides? You're kind of interviewing them in an informal way. Are they taking sides? Are they already asking personal questions as to what was the cause for divorce and, um, getting in the emotional side of it? Um, do you get a feel from them that they're natural problem solver, that they're a natural counselor almost, because they're going to have to be, like I said in the beginning, a mediator, but they're also going to have to be very comfortable with taking control, not in a negative way, but taking authority and being able to lead the way because throughout this journey, there are going to be times that you and your spouse are not agreeing or we're stuck on step one and we really need to make it to step two and you guys are not agreeing, you have to have that agent that can say, hey guys, I understand that what we're dealing with is difficult. Um, you guys are stuck right now, but hey, my job is to get this property sold for you all. And in order to do that, we're gonna have to come together. This is the decision that needs to be made now this will help us to make it to step two so we can ultimately get to the finish line. And someone that both of you guys can say, all right, she's right. Let's just get along for the sake of making it to the finish line. And so you have to have that agent that's comfortable with taking authority and leading the way. And like I said, you can typically tell this through a conversation and just that natural um, a, an agent that's right for the job, that's right for a divorce situation will be able to naturally um, tell you what's going to happen next. They'll be able to navigate the situation for you because the last thing you want to have to do is figure out what do I do next? Um, how do I prepare the home uh, for the market? You don't want to have to think about those kind of things because you're already trying to, um, I guess, protect your feelings, protect the kids, if you have kids together, you trying to keep as much normalcy as you can in the household. So you don't have time to monitor the real estate transaction and babysit everyone. You have to have an, an agent that's comfortable with taking the lead and working with your attorney to get things done. Number two, after you choose your real estate agent, the second most important thing is going to be getting a market analysis done on the property, which your real estate agent should be able to handle. Um, and I, this is what me and my team, we do this for all of our divorce clients. The first thing we do is run a market analysis. And ultimately, we're just looking in the area. We want to know what other properties have sold for within the last 90 days. Ideally, within the last 30 days, if we can find some activity, but if we can't, we'll go back as far as 90 days and say, hey, other properties in the area that are com comparable to your property. So if your property is uh, a two story home, three bedroom, two bath, uh, 2050 square feet, we are going to look for similar homes that compare in bedrooms, square footage age, um, two story, right? Plans to say, all right, show me on the market. What, what is the data? Where are the facts to show me what these type of properties have sold for within the last 90 days? And if there, you know, hopefully there, there's some results within the last 90 days. If not, sometimes we go back a little further. Um, 
However, the more recent, the better. And we use that to help determine or give an opinion of what we believe your home to sell for. So we give an estimated opinion of value. We can give you an estimated days on market. That's really important because we want to know, all right, are properties in this area staying on the market for four days? Or is it taking a little bit longer? Are the average days on market 27 days. You know, that's important in the market analysis because that gives you guys an idea of how soon do you need to be prepared to maybe move on and find out what your next step is going to be and move out. You know, are you going to buy again or lease again? And so within the market analysis, again, we're looking for most recent activity um, with properties that are comparable to yours. Uh, average days on market. And we use that basic information to do an estimate of what your net profit can be or will be. And so once we know how much it can sell for, we will have you guys to order a loan payoff statement. So you will uh, contact your mortgage company, order a loan payoff. And once that payoff comes in, now you're able to get an idea of what your estimated profit would be, right? So just for easy math, let's say we take a property, your property, we say, hey, your property can sell for $200,000. You know, all the other properties in your area are selling for $200,000. And then you provide us your loan payoff and we say, okay, you owe $150,000 on your mortgage, okay? Okay. So that gives us an estimate to say, okay, that leaves $50,000. Well, from that $50,000, you have to think about, you still have title transfer fees because you have to transfer title to the new buyer. You have real estate agent commission fees. Um, And so we'll throw all of that in there to show you as a seller, what are your expenses? What closing costs do you have to be prepared for as a seller? And we'll have that broken down into what we call um, a net sheet. And it shows your net estimated profit. So you'll see, hey, sales price, 200000 mortgage loan payoff, one fifty. That brings us down to $50,000 in profit. Now you start backing out of your title fees, your commission fees, and now we may be down to a total profit of $39,000. Then you and your spouse are able to look at that 39 and say, oh, well, we're talking 50-50. This 39 is now divided into two, okay? And that is the first place where we start because that's usually where the anger happens, (laughs) Um, or that's usually where the excitement happens. Maybe you've been in the property for quite some time and you've accumulated much more equity than you thought. And your payoff between the two is a good payday, a good payoff. Or maybe it's not so great. And you're like, it pisses you off all over again. Excuse my language, but it pisses you off all over again because the loss in your mind that you're having to take is a reminder of this relationship going south. So the agent is there to reel you back in and say, hey, I know that this may not have ideally been the profit that you were looking for, so to speak. However, what's your next option? Because in some cases, you don't have another option. Um, Are you going to not sell at all? Or are you going to argue and bicker back and forth about Who's going to get the keep? Who's going to get to keep the property? Um, is one going to stay there and maybe rent it out from the other one? Like, what other options do you have? And if there are no other alternatives to selling, you have to learn how to swallow <laughs> that profit uh, really fast and be comfortable with what that leaves you. And the most important thing to keep in mind is the quicker you can accept the facts for what they are the quicker that you can pull the trigger, move forward and say, all right, what's next? What do we have to do in order to get to the finish line? Because the finish line is where the reset button is. You know, the reset button is what's going to allow you to close the chapter, start your new journey, pick up the pieces, begin the healing process or whatever that looks like for for you. But until you swallow the facts, (laughs) we can't get there. So, and another thing, sometimes, you know, somebody says, well, you know, I had in my mind, I really thought that, you know, I'm not selling unless we can sell it for you, unless we can profit 50,000 each. 
Well, the facts are the facts. And the market, if the market doesn't support that and an agent has has the data and they've proven to the attorneys or the judge and they have the facts to say, hey, we can't pull another, what, another $20,000 total profit because in order to do that, we'd have to sell the property for $20,000 more. And based on the research and based on the market analysis that I've just shown you, I've listed out all of the previous addresses that you can go and compare your home to. Selling this home for $20,000 more to get you an additional profit is not an option. So what do you do in that case? So step number one, after you choose your real estate broker, is to look at that market analysis that they provided and look at your estimated net sheet. And that is going to tell you and give you an idea of what your estimated 50-50 profit share is going to be. A lot of times um, this is also needed to uh, give to the attorneys because they need this information for the divorce decree. Because in the divorce decree, they typically have, hey, this is the real estate brokerage and the agent that both parties have agreed to use. Because I see that too, where they're having a uh, a disagreement about this person wants to use cousin cousin Jane, that's an agent, and another party wants to use, you know, a classmate that they went to school with twenty years ago. And again, just to be petty or just to make it difficult for one another, they won't agree to come together and use the same agent. So. Once you use the same agent, typically the attorneys have to put that information in the divorce decree. And they also take that market analysis information that the agent provided because that goes into the divorce decree as well. It says, hey, um, this is the highest sales price um, that we can sell for. And it's so almost a range. Here's the highest we can sell for. Here's the lowest that we can sell for. And we're agreeing to that. Based on that, this gives us an estimated range of profit of, you know, 30 to 40,000 that was going to be split 50, 50. So this is information. And that's why that stuff has to be done at the very beginning, because this information uh, typically goes to the attorneys to get input it into the divorce decree. Now, now that we've agreed on a real estate broker, now that we've agreed on net profit and it's get, it has gotten entered into the divorce decree. Now it's official. Now we can start the process of getting to the real deal, which is putting the house on the market. So once you guys agree to put on the house, put the house on the market, it's time to talk about preparing the house for market. And this is where it gets emotional as well, because it's time for the agent to visit the property to, you know, to come to walk around and to tell you, huh, okay, we're going to need to take those pictures off the wall you know, personal pictures, things like that. And so if you haven't started doing so already, the process of taking down the wedding photos and the family Christmas pictures and boxing them up and taking all of the things that um, remind someone of what family is, you know, that's when it gets real for you. Because a lot of times, you know, you know that you're getting a divorce. You know that you're going through the steps. But once you start taking pictures off the wall, boxing up clothes, um, the home becomes more of a shell or the home becomes more of a house than a home, so to speak. And it gets real at that point. And so we find that emotions start kicking back up again. Um, I've had it with some of my clients. They have a change of heart throughout the process. Uh, You know, it's, are you sure you want to do this? Because they start watching those fam, those family photos and those memories go into the boxes that get pushed into the garage. And so it's like, uh, what are we doing here? So there's a lot of, you know, moving pieces throughout this process. And that's why your agent has to be very patient with you guys as well, because it truly is a roller coaster ride. Um, along the way. But anyway, back to the point of preparing the house for market. So we already covered taking down your personal items. So we'll go through there, taking the pictures off the wall. Um, But one of the main pieces is going to be deciding on repairs versus selling as is. Um, In some cases, you may have um, the husband that says, hey, I want to replace the carpet. I want to paint. 
I know that we had redid the game room. The game room is blue. I want to paint that a neutral color. And so, or, or it could be the wife. Someone has a bright idea of the repairs or what they want to do or what they have in mind to get the property market ready. And I always say, whoa, 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 wait a minute, don't move too fast. Wait until your agent comes for the property visit because they have more of an idea and an eye for what consumers are looking for. And what you don't want to do is you don't want to spend a lot of money because things may still be in pretty good condition and you don't want to spend money maybe painting the whole house like an oatmeal brown color. I don't know. Just you may like neutral colors. So you say, yeah, I'm going to start off on a clean slate. We'll do a nice clean paint job. And you spend time, whether you pay somebody to do it, that's money, or whether you put on your overalls and have a paint party and you paint yourself, you don't want to spend time painting the home and the buyer that's going to buy it comes in and they love gray. So they're going to come in and completely paint over everything you just did. Give the consumer the option for that. So your agent will be able to say, no, no, no. How you have it is completely fine. Leave it as is because a consumer is going to want, or a buyer is going to want to come in here and paint the way they want to paint. They may like the blue carpet um, or the green carpet that your wife thought was hideous. The new person may like the green carpet. So before you spend money on repairs and fixing things, give it a minute. Don't do anything yet. Wait till your agent visits the property and they'll give you tips and tricks on what to do. Um, Another thing you don't want to do or you could do a good tip is um, an inspection report. Uh, Most times when you're selling a property, be prepared that a buyer is going to order an inspection report, much like if you bought a car and you wanted to see what was going on under the hood and you have a mechanic to come and check the car out to make sure the car is a decent car. Similar, it's the same thing with the house. A buyer will have an inspection report ordered. And so a good rule of thumb, it's not a requirement, but it could help you in the long run. A good require, a, a good point of, uh, a good rule of thumb is for you to get an inspection report done yourself. That way you already have an idea of what comes out on the report and what a buyer could potentially co- have shown on their report. And so you maybe you'll make the choice to say, oh man, The report shows that the air conditioning unit needs to be serviced. Let's go ahead and get that done before a buyer gets it done. And then they try to lowball us on the offer because of these things that come back on the inspection report. So if you were going to do anything, I, you know, I highly suggest maybe getting an inspection report just so that you have knowledge or you're not met with any surprises from a buyer that wants to buy it and they come with this 10 page report. Like, did you know termites were eating, eating the back of the house out, you know? And it's like, Oh, I didn't know that. But that way, if you know already, you can kind of prepare. And those are some of the items you can uh, do to prepare the home for market versus, uh, I think I'm going to paint that blue wall gray. Like don't, don't do that yet until your agent visits the property. Um, some of the other things that are talked about uh, during, during uh, preparing property for market, is showing instructions because unless you guys are still are moving out before you put the house on the market, you guys are still living there. And a lot of times you're still living there with the kids and the dogs and the bird and the fish and whatever else you have, (laughs) you're still living there. So one of the biggest things to talk about during a divorce, when you're putting your house on the market is what are we going to agree on for the showing instructions? Um, which is really important. We have to, you know, tell your agent, hey, um, Monday through Fridays after two o'clock is better or the weekends are better or every day is fine. Any time of day, we just need two hours in advance notice to give us time to scoop up all the kids and get out of here and drive around the corner while the showings take place. So that's going to be very important. Um, Now, mind you, the thing with showing instructions is that when you still live in the in the property and you're occupying the property, it's kind of tricky because you want, obviously it's easier to do it maybe during the day when you guys are off at work or maybe on the weekends when you're going to be off running errands and stuff. But the more restrictions you have on your showings, 
the more difficult it is for agents, for other agents to bring in buyers to tour the property. Uh, so you want to have less restrictions on your showing instructions as possible to make sure you get the kind of traffic and the kind of flow that you're looking for. Um, but if you can, you know, you definitely want to put the the dogs in the garage or, or in the backyard, you know, or in a cage, at least you don't want them roaming around sniffing on your visitors. <laughs> that could, that could be a whole nother issue happening. But yeah, so that's the thing that, that we'll talk about, you know, you know, showing instructions. What are the time frame for showings? Do you want a lockbox on the door? Um, and we've had this have be a problem because maybe the wife, the, the husband says, yeah, put a lockbox on the door. It's more convenient. The key is already accessible so that when another agent wants to bring their buyer, they can just access the key box. Well, the wife may come in and say, oh, no, I don't want a lockbox on my door. Anybody can have access and they can come in and out as they please. They might they might go in and look at my intimate uh, drawer and go through my business. I don't know who those people are. They may be smelling my perfume. <laughs> you know, women just think a little differently. Um, and so there's this, uh-oh, we have to navigate here we go playing mediator again, having to navigate and have you um, have a meeting of the minds to say, hey, remember, if we don't have a convenient way for other agents to show up and tour the property with their buyers, that means every time you have a showing uh, request, one of you guys have will have to be here to open the door. And maybe that's not a problem. You may work from home. And so in that case, it's not that big of a deal, but you don't want to have to be you stuck doing that. So those are ty the type of things to keep in mind and to think about when you're talking about preparing the home for market. Now, we've talked about choosing a broker. We've talked about market analysis and getting comfortable with what that net profit may look like once you have to split it 50-50. We've talked about preparing the home for market. Um, so finally, we got to think about the next move what does life after divorce look like? What is your life after selling this home look like? And that's going to look different for the both of you because one may decide, Hey, I'm, I, I need stability. I've put too much into this home. I'm going to go right back into the buying market because this this situation threw me for a loop and I don't want to be all discombobulated. I need to get back into a firm environment, stable environment. I want to buy a house. I'm going to go right back into the housing market and purchase again. The other spouse may be like, hey, whatever, suit yourself. I don't care what you do, but I'm going to go rent me a one bedroom apartment with a balcony and a pool view so I can chill out and watch the ducks come and go off the balcony or something. Like you guys are going to, get comfortable and realize that, oh man, like the life that we once had together is now separate. And we have a purchase offer. We have a buyer under contract to buy this home. They're going to be closing in 30 days. We have to think about what's next. And that's also where it gets emotional again, because now you're having to come up with the decision of what's next. And what I will say, there is no right or wrong. It is going to be on based on personal preference. And what you're going to have to make sure you do is get really comfortable with that decision. Um, because one spouse, the other one spouse may make you feel bad for, I can't believe you go and rent an apartment, you know? And so what? Yeah, that's what I'm doing. You know, so, and not to say, well, remember the goal is not to be confrontational. So we're going to be nice about it, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I'm renting a apartment that that's where I am right now. That's the season that I'm moving into. This is what my new chapter looks like for me. And I'm okay with that. So maybe you just decide to rent, sign a one-year lease and rent somewhere. And maybe you decide to buy after that. It's okay. And you don't have to explain that, to explain that and have acceptance for or validation from the next person about it. You just have to be comfortable with what that looks like. And so you have to decide whether or not the agent that represented both of you guys to help sell the home. In most cases, you've established a really good relationship with this broker or this agent. You're comfortable with them. They've been all up in your business so far through during this transaction. And so it's easier for you to just use that same agent and say, all right, you helped us close out the sale. Now, 
help me find another home or help me uh, find another lease property. And so in most cases, that's why it's so important to pick the right agent because this agent is going to be all wrapped up in this situation. They're going to help you guys sell your home together. And then individually, they can help navigate what's next for you both as you go your separate ways. And it's very important to have an agent that you trust as well, because, you know, the transaction of selling the home. Yeah. The agent represents you collectively together, but as you go your separate ways, that relationship is going to turn into the agent representing one of the ex-spouses individually and the other one individually. So it goes from a collective representation to an individual representation. And so you have to know that this is a person that I can trust on both sides of it. And it's not someone that's going to go back and tell my business and, I've gotten wind that something I shared with them showed back up out of the other person's mouth. So now I know the agent was discussing my business with the next person. Like that's a whole other animal to worry about. And you don't want to have to deal with that. Like I said, you have much more to deal uh, to deal with. And so I hope that this has been helpful. Um, I know again, navigating real estate uh, and divorce, liquidating your property, liquidating an asset, because, you know, let's be honest your home is one of the largest assets that you will probably ever own. And so the fact that you've done that with someone that you thought you were going to share the rest of your life with and doesn't work out that way. And now not only are you grieving the loss of a relationship, you're grieving the loss of a large asset that you purchased together and the home that you've created for your family and your kids. And you, it, there's a whirlwind of things going on in your mind. And so we have to really get clear on dry, drawing that line keeping emotions on one side, business and facts on the other side, and working together to ultimately get you to the finish line so that you can hit the reset button and start this new chapter. And also remember, and I can speak from experience because I've gone through a divorce. I was I went through a divorce years ago and I've gotten remarried again. And so now getting married again may not be your thing and that's fine, but just know there's life after this. And sometimes when you're wrapped up in it, it doesn't seem like it. And so you're just like, oh, if I can just get to the end of this road, like this is all driving me nuts. When you're wrapped up in the middle of it, it can seem really heavy. It, it honestly, it can seem really heavy, but, but I promise you, once you get to the end, it's just like a huge relief, a huge weight has been lifted off your uh, off of your shoulders and you can really figure out what's next for me. And so that's what you should do. Get excited, you know, as, as excited as possible um, about what this next chapter looks like for you and the journey ahead. And as always, my team is here to help navigate that process. Um, if you need um, a good agent, good team that can help navigate the situation of divorce and real estate, we are here. Feel free to reach out and we can help um, get your market analysis prepared. And until next time, you have been tuned in to the throne. And I'm your host, Matasha LaQuinn, the queen bee of real estate. And we'll talk to you soon. Bye.